Great. So again, welcome everyone to this introductory workshop on single cell RNA sequencing. First, I'll introduce myself. My name is Brianne. I'm a postdoc here at UCLA in the lab of Professor Eric Deeds. My background is in biochemistry and my PhD fo research focused on the development of live cell imaging tools. And I use live cell imaging to study how metabolism and growth are coordinated at the single cell level. And this really helped me develop some intuition about how to analyze single cell data. So now I'm using single cell RNA-seq data to ask questions about the general shape of gene expression in the context of tissue homeostasis and the evolution of multicellularity. So the purpose of this workshop is to help prepare researchers interested in designing and analyzing a single cell RNA sequencing experiment. Um, like Eloy said, if you're a student uh, taking this workshop for, for credit, there will be a short quiz and a homework assignment at the end of the three days. Okay, so now let me introduce this workshop and its learning objectives. The goal of the workshop is to generally increase the understanding and accessibility of single cell RNA-seq technology and analysis tools. At the end of the workshop, participants should be able to make informed decisions on the design of single cell RNA-seq experiments. So we'll start by discussing what kinds of questions can be asked with single cell RNA-seq technology um, and what specific technology is best for answering different questions. Um, we'll also discuss experimental tools that are available to help deal with technical variation and we'll conclude with a discussion of trade-offs between cost and sensitivity benefits um, of the study choice. So participants can also expect to learn how to conduct a complete single cell RNA-seq analysis using the ScanPy software in Python. Um, I chose this one over the other commonly used Surat software in R because I find Python more intuitive, but both tools can do the exact same thing. Um, so you can really follow along using either if you prefer. Um, and this modular software package enables the customized use of quality control procedures, dimensionality reduction tools, cell type clustering, differential gene expression, pseudo time algorithms, and so on. So finally, students can expect to understand the core analytical challenges faced in the interpretation of these studies we'll discuss the challenges that are introduced by having single cell resolution. So one major difference here compared to the bulk is the challenge of deconvolving technical noise with biological variation um, that both occur within and between groups of transcriptionally similar cells. We'll discuss how this issue makes cell type clustering challenging. Um, and finally, students can expect to leave with a critical understanding of the motivating concepts and assumptions of different dimensionality reduction tools that are used in single cell RNA-seq analysis. So overall, I think it's really important to understand that the analysis of single cell RNA-seq is a relatively new practice and the comprehension of this data is a very active ongoing area of research where new tools are continuously being developed. So it's my aim to prepare you to have the tools you need to critically assess the utility of existing and emerging methods. Um, so you can have a little bit more knowledge about how to interpret this data. Okay. So here I'll give a daily breakdown of the workshops organization. The typical goal of single cell RNA-seq studies is to resolve the transcriptional differences of populations of cells and then be able to compare differences among subpopulations. So today we're going to cover experimental approaches and quality control procedures. On the second day, we'll cover how to deal with and visualize variation. So on day two, I'll introduce dimensionality reduction as a concept and then go over some of its tools and how we can use these tools to visualize axes of variation within this very high dimensional data. And then on the third day, we'll discuss different clustering algorithms and uh, various downstream analysis tools. So each day I'll start with a lecture that's about an hour to an hour and a half long, uh, 
and apparently has automated transitions, sorry. Please feel free to interrupt me with questions along the way. Um, after each major section, I'll recap what we learned using uh, the Kahoot game quizzes and also have more time set aside for questions. And after the lectures, we'll move on to a participatory analysis experiment in Python that covers the topics of the day. So by the end of the workshop, we'll work our way through the entire ScanPy pipeline to complete an analysis of lymphatic cells. Although um, after today, you're very welcome to go and uh, either find a different data set you're interested in, or you're also welcome to use your own data for this workshop. And then on day three, we'll do an additional experiment that evaluates different pipelines and compares how well they do. Okay, so let's get started. A major question in biology is how does the composition and function of a tissue change during development or disease? And a classical way to address this question is by using histology. Using this method, you can take sections of a tissue and then stain for different cellular markers and then compare how they change across your experimental conditions. This approach is great for visualizing changes in tissue morphology, but the number of molecules you can measure in a given sample is limited. So as a result, this approach is limited in the amount of information that can be measured about the state of a tissue. Um, enter single cell RNA sequencing. Single cell RNA sequencing is motivated by the same kinds of questions as histological studies, yet instead of a handful of proteins being measured, single cell RNA-seq can assess the global state of all mRNA transcripts being expressed within a tissue with single cell resolution. So with these high content measures, the tool has the potential to revolutionize biology because it allows you to compare gene expression patterns both across different cell types and also within different cell types. So single cell RNA sequencing enables questions about tissue heterogeneity and how cells transition between different physiological states. So one example of how powerful this tool is comes from a recent cell type atlas type of project. So in this study, researchers combined single cell RNA sequencing with fluorescent microscopy to track the expression of specific transcription factors and reconstruct the entire developmental trajectory of a whole organism, specifically here, the nematode C. elegans. So here is a UMAP projection of 86,000 cells from C. elegans, colored by their reconstructed developmental trajectories from gastrulation stage in orange all the way out to the terminal differentiation stage in purple and pink with their corresponding transcriptional states mapped with the help of microscopy. So single cell RNA sequencing has become a very popular technique because it allows this high content and high throughput snap snapshots of biological samples with single cell resolution. However, it's also very new technology. And unfortunately, many approaches to the analysis of this data are informed more by history than by empirical or theoretical justification. So first, we're going to talk about the history of transcriptional profiling to gain some perspective on the current moment in the field. Um, we'll then talk about the history of transcriptional, um, no, no, we'll talk about the evolution of single cell RNA-seq technologies and the different types of technologies available today. Um, then we'll begin our discussion on different ways of dealing with technical variation. Um, there are many different practices being used, and the best approach to analyzing this data has yet to be worked out. So I hope you'll gain some perspective on the kinds of challenges encountered in analyzing single-cell RNA-seq data and the different ways of approaching them. Okay, so how has the history of transcriptional profiling shaped some of the concepts and approaches to the study of gene expression patterns today? Uh, it started in the late 2000s, roughly, where microarrays were the first technology that enabled systematic measurement of transcriptional changes across samples. Uh, so in this approach, researchers typically collected two different samples, for example, say a treated versus untreated sample of cancer cells. Um, in one of the lysates, the mRNA were labeled in red, and in the other lysate, the mRNAs were labeled with a green fluorescent oligonucleotide. 
And the samples were then combined and loaded onto a chip where each spot on the chip was coded to capture the mRNA of one specific gene. So because the two samples were both loaded onto the same spot, an early example of multiplexing, the color of the spot indicates the ratio at which the, transfer, the transcript was expressed between the two samples. So this practice was where researchers began to compare fold changes in gene expression. Um, it pra it's, this practice is still widely used today, even though we might not have a quantitative grasp yet on how fold changes in specific genes might map to the physiology of different cells. Um, so advances in sequencing technology began to make bulk mRNA sequencing experiments more economically feasible. And, and this approach allowed researchers to then measure all of the mRNA expressed within a sample with high resolution, which allowed people to start looking at different types of isoforms, splice sites, and so on that exist between different um, samples. However, a major limitation of this approach is that the bulk measurement represents the average mRNA level across the entire sample. Thus, differences in cell type specific gene expression differences are lost, and other types of single cell heterogeneity cannot be recovered by bulk approaches. So this graph summarizes the difference in resolution between bulk mRNA sequencing and single cell mRNA sequencing using charts. So imagine an example here where yellow cells express 100 copies of transcription factor A colored in red, while the other cells have zero copies of this mRNA. Bulk RNA sequencing would assign 25 counts per million of transcription factor red. But imagine in a disease state, yellow cells decrease the expression of this gene to 50, and purple cells also increase their expression of this gene to 50 counts per cell. We would have the same amount of transcription factor in our sample, even though its cellular distribution has changed. So the ability to overcome this obfuscation uh, and resolve gene expression changes at the single cell and cell type levels is what motivates many researchers to take the single cell sequencing approach. Um, so another advantage of single cell mRNA sequencing is that by sampling mRNA counts with single cell resolution, we recover information about the manifold or the shape or topology of gene expression space that exists in individual cells. And this is like really cool and new and exciting and can potentially lead to interesting questions about the dynamics of gene expression and cell identity transitions. Okay, so now let's discuss in a little bit more detail about how this technology came to be. So inside of a single mammalian cell, there's approximately 0.1 picograms of mRNA. This is a very, very small quantity. It roughly translates to 300,000 molecules total. And to get good coverage in current next generation sequencing machines, we typically need to give the machine 5,000 times the amount of transcript material than what's expressed in a single cell. So one of the first innovations happened in 2009, where Trang et al. published a manuscript describing the ability to efficiently amplify and sequence mRNA collected from individual cells. Um, then StartSeq was the first tool that allowed one-step barcoding of different cells. And barcoding is a common approach in all sequencing studies that enables researchers to pool individual cells or samples together um, to allow multiplexing. SMART and SealSeq introduced fact sorting to sort single cells into plates. And then Fluidime and SmartSeq2 incorporated microfluidic tools to reduce the amount of free agents that are consumed. And this decrease in price allowed the technique to become more widely used around 2014. So DropSeq, InDrop, and 10X Genomics introduced microfluidic droplet chemistry where nanoliter-sized droplets encapsulate cells and barcoding beads. And this approach decreases background noise and further decreases the cost, thus increasing the number of cells that can be sequenced. So finally, high-density microplate technologies such as um, BD Rhapsody have been introduced. Um, and these improve the mRNA capture process to increase the coverage of the transcript zone. So. 
So today we were looking at our typical data sets that are comprised of tens of thousands of cells that can reach upwards of 1 million cells. Um, and really recently we've seen this technology explode in its use and interest. Okay, so again, instead of a single measure of how gene expression changes across a population compared to a control, look, a control group, we now have a way to measure the distribution of gene expression levels for each gene across the entire population of cells. Uh, and the goals of single cell RNA sequencing are to measure the distribution of these transcripts across populations of different kinds of cells. Um, this allows researchers to measure transcriptional differences across and within groups of cells and generally to resolve single cell heterogeneity. Though it's up to the researcher to then try and design experiments that get at the biology of what this all means. So I'll give a couple of examples of applications for this technology and then maybe some of you can share the questions you might be addressing using this tool. Um, so one example is just to generally characterize the cellular and transcriptional composition of tissues to get an idea of what is there and how things might change in response to a perturbation. Um, for example, do the number of different cell types change or is it the transcriptional profiles that slightly change across all the cells? don't really know still. Another example is to use this approach to evaluate, evaluate developmental processes to understand how transcriptional expression changes while cells undergo differentiation. Another interesting question is to evaluate how, say, cancer cells evolve or develop resistance to specific therapies. Um, would anyone like to share what you are working on? I can potentially connect with others who are working on similar projects. Yeah, um, this is Vicki, I'll share. Um, so basically, I'm um, an oncologist and then um, we had an early phase clinical trial testing um, a novel uh, drug. And so we actually collected uh, pre um, and on treatment samples and did single cell profiling to see if we can um, gather like biomarkers um, of uh, response to the drug. Um, and then um, I'm also collecting uh, biopsy samples of uh, lung cancer patients. Um, to try to understand um, how they respond to uh, checkpoint inhibitor therapy. That's really interesting. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I'm a first year grad student. This is Paul Vander. Um, and so what I'm gonna be doing for my, my thesis research is looking at um, estrogen receptor expressing neurons in the uh, preoptic area of the hypothalamus, which are known to be important for regulation of temperature and metabolism. Um, and so one of the things that I want to do is characterize how estrogen um, affects these cells. Um, and so in order to do that, what I plan to do is um, basically inject estrogen into this area of the brain and then harvest the cells for, for single cell sequencing um, to see how different populations of cells within this area respond to estrogen um, and what sort of gene expression changes are induced. Wow, cool. Thank you. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you for sharing those examples. Um, I think you'll find there's lots of people at UCLA doing kind of similar studies across different departments. Oops, yeah. um, okay, so now let's talk about how this measurement works experimentally in greater detail. So first, uh, I'll be going over the droplet-based single cell RNA sequencing approach, though, though there are some other plate-based approaches that are slightly different. 
Um, but in both approaches, the first thing that happens is a tissue is dissociated to create a cell suspension. And the preparation of solid tissues can be tricky because solid tissues require digestion, or digestion of the extracellular matrix and cell-to-cell -cell junctions in order to separate individual cells. Um, but dissociation must also be gentle enough to preserve membrane integrity. If methods are too harsh, dead cells will release RNAs into the extracellular liquid, and these ambient RNAs will become encapsulated into the droplets alongside cells, which will then contaminate the output. Um, it's also possible to use methanol-based fixation methods early, either before or after tissue dissociation and prior to the droplet encapsulation step to allow samples to be stored for several months. I've read that methanol fixation um, can better preserve the mRNA compared to freezing and thawing of samples, which is generally not encouraged. So when all samples have been collected for sequencing, the cells are separated into individual droplets and flow cytometry can be used during this step to quantify the quality of the sample in terms of cell viability and successful separation of neighboring cells. So here facts or even magnetic associated cell separation can be used to measure cell composition by binding cell surface markers with antibodies um, and this can be useful, this pre-binding with fluorescent activated cell sorting as having some knowledge of the cell type beforehand can be useful for the identification of cell types or the expectation of proportions of cell types that you'd like to look for later on in your analysis. So fluorescent activated cell sorting can also be used slightly differently to enrich for specific cell types, such as those that are more rare in your sample, like stem cells or whatever special subset of cells you might be interested in. So after sample preparation, a critical step of this technology is droplet encapsulation. And the three most popular technologies use water and oil reaction chambers. In these chambers, individual cells are flowed into um, the machine to merge with a droplet that contains a single bead with barcodes and other reaction materials. Uh, these beads have barcodes that bind to the mRNA inside of the cell and mark each mRNA as belonging to the same cell. So this is done inside droplets as the small volume decreases the cost and also increases the probability that these barcodes bind to the mRNAs. Um, and while there's some variation between these three technologies, the concept is the same. And the merging of cells and barcoded beads with droplets follows a Poisson distribution of possibilities. So here drops can contain either no beads and no cells. They can contain no beads and one or more cells, one or more beads and one or more cells, or they can have only one or more beads and no cells. So the proportion is a function of the concentration of both beads and cells and cell doublets where more than one cell in a droplet with a bead can cause a problem because then you have an issue where two cells are barcoded, barcoded within the same, with the same sequence. So later on the collection of mRNA sequence from these two cells are indexed with the same barcode and thus appear as belonging to the same cell. When in reality, they might represent two totally different cell types with different gene expression patterns. Um, so to keep cell doublets below 5%, DropSeq is only able to barcode about two to 5% of cells. And InDrop and 10 chromium have overcome this major loss in cells by changing the statistical distribution of droplet packing by using deformable gel beads. So this way about 80% of the viable cells in your sample can be barcoded for sequencing. Okay. So after the cells are distributed into droplets, the cells are lysed, its contents are released, the poly-A tails of the mRNAs bind to the oligo oligonucleotides on the capture beads, and then reverse transcriptase is used to synthesize cDNA and incorporate a cell barcode and a unique molecular identifier into the same cDNA molecule. So after cDNA synthesis, the cDNA is amplified using PCR 
And then the cDNA is fragmented, fragmented so sequencing adapters can be added. Um, multiplexing adapters can also be added here if different samples are being combined, for example, like two different drug treatments in an experiment. And then the library is sequenced using Illumina instruments. Sequencing is read from the three, three prime end only. So the first read reads the cell barcode and then the unique molecular identifier. Um, and the second read reads the gene sequence. Uh, the data is then demultiplexed. And the goal of demultiplexing is to first identify barcodes that represent real cells, not just background ambient mRNA. And then once a list of real cell barcodes are created, each UMI read is aligned with a reference genome so that a data matrix is created where each row in the data matrix represents a cell and each column represents a gene. And the entries are counts that identify how many unique molecular identifiers were found for each gene within individual cells. So if you're using the 10X genomics platform, this process is done using the CellRanger software while other approaches use an algorithm called star align and UMI tools. So once we create a cell by gene express and matrix, the data can be analyzed for differential expression, cell type clustering, pseudotime analysis, or other approaches. Okay, so at the end of this experiment, only 10 to 20% cell of cells from the original sample are captured and sequenced. And within each cell, typically only 5% of the mRNAs are captured and sequenced. And this low capture probability gives rise to a very sparse, noisy, and high dimensional expression matrix that poses numerous challenges for the interpretation of single cell mRNA sequencing experiments. So first let's talk about why is the capture probability so low? So here this droplet encapsulation step is very prone to technical issues. First, the mRNA molecules don't always bind to the beads as the mRNA has a very low concentration to begin with. So it's kind of a stochastic binding process that depends on the concentration. And second, reverse transcription enzymes are inefficient and don't always work, especially in the presence of contaminants or variable chemistry like cell goo. Uh, and third, the, effic the efficacy of efficiency, sorry, of reverse transcription and PCR can depend on the specific transcript being amplified. So as a result, only about 5% of the mRNA within the cell is actually captured and sequenced. Um, if you care instead about only a few hundred specific genes, the BD Rhapsody platform offers an alternative where the molecular targeting of specific transcripts can improve the detection and sensitivity of low abundant genes with a trade-off of uh, the loss of whole transcript amplification. Um, but getting back to the droplet-based single cell RNA sequencing, uh, unique molecular identifiers and identifiers have enabled um, a key innovation that can overcome this amplification induced noise. So even when you have a very low probability of mRNA capture, then a unique molecular identifier allows single cell RNA-seq to accurately quantify how many unique mRNA molecules were counted within each cell prior to the amplification step. So let's talk a bit more in detail now about the difference between reads and UMI count data. Okay. So what is a UMI? As we know, PCR involves an exponential increase in the copy number of molecules. Thus, small differences in numbers and PCR efficiency are amplified during this process. And the solution here was to label each mRNA with a unique barcode at the reverse transcription step before the mRNAs are amplified. And this is called the unique molecular identifier. So the read count is the total number of mRNAs from a gene that are sequenced by the Illumina machine. Sorry. And um, the UMI count is the total number of unique mRNAs for a gene that were captured prior to the amplification step. 
So as long as you have sufficient read depth in your sequencing machine, the UMI count is independent from how many times your transcript was amplified by PCR. So to provide a visual, here inside of the microfluidic device, cells and beads are flowed into the same stream at a rate that gives a high probability of each droplet containing only one bead and only one cell. And these beads have both cell barcodes as well as UMI barcodes, so that when the cell is lysed inside of a single droplet, each mRNA is labeled with the same cell barcode but a different unique molecular identifier. So in the quantification of single cell RNA-seq data, what is quantified is the number of unique molecular identifiers captured for each kind of messenger RNA. So if you have a transcript for say, the protein ATP synthase, if you capture four ATP synthase molecules within one cell, you will end up with you count four unique molecular identifiers for that species of mRNA. So all four UMIs are amplified, but it's the number of unique molecular identifiers that are counted that correspond to the abundance of each species of mRNA within each cell. So UMI counts are what exists in your final gene by cell matrix that is used for the analysis. So as this technology continues to develop, researchers have devised a way to measure how well each of the single cell RNA sequencing technologies perform. And to do this experiment, there exists a set of synthetic um, cDNAs known as the ERCC spikins. And in this 2017 publication by Svensson et al., um, the researchers spiked these synthetic cDNAs into their cell sample and then evaluated the performance of a number of different single cell RNA sequencing approaches. Um, and because they know the concentration of the ERCC spikins beforehand, they're able to measure how well each technique performs using metrics such as sensitivity, accuracy, precision, power, and efficiency. Okay. So in this experiment, Svensson and all quantified how well different single cell RNA-seq technologies performed as a function of read depth, where read depth is the number of times the sequencing machine reads the mRNAs in your samples. So here researchers wanted to know how many sequencing reads in the sequencing machine are required to accurately sample the data, such that the appropriate number of ERCC spike in UMI tags are recovered. So we can do this experiment because we have an a priori expectation of how many ERCC counts we expect to see as the concentration is known beforehand. So they found that the accuracy of different single cell RNA sequencing technologies is only marginally dependent on the read depth of your Illumina sequencing machine. So here you can see that as you increase the number of reads per cell from 1,000 to uh, 1 million, you only marginally increase the accuracy of your uh, UMI counts. As accuracy saturates as about, at about 4.5 million reads. You can also see here that among the most commonly used approaches, it's the 10X chromium that has the least amount of technical variation in accuracy. So in contrast, this graph illustrates how sensitivity is critically dependent on read depth. So as you increase the number of sequence reads per cell from 1,000 to 1 million, you go from a detection limit of 10,000 molecules down to approximately 10 molecules with the orders of magnitudes of difference in the detection limit across the different methods. So this means that because the probability of mRNA capture is so low, it doesn't matter how many reads you do in the sequencing machine there is a smaller probability of observing mRNAs that are expressed at lower counts within cells, especially if there are fewer than 10 molecules per cell to start with. And this can be problematic because it's been approximated that for mammalian cells, there exist about four copies of each mRNA on average within each cell. Um, so when there are so many factors, how can we decide which technology is best? 
One thing to consider is how many cells can you sample? Do you have an unlimited number of cells? Or are you working with potentially animal or patient data where the number of cells that you have is limited? Um, the number of cells that you sample can become especially problematic if you're most interested in studying a cell population that is more rare in abundance. Um, so when choosing methods, we want to know how efficient the method is in capturing both cells and mRNAs. Um, there are also considerations for complex tissues. It can be easier to isolate and separate um, only cell nucleuses in complex tissues, though this method is less efficient at capturing mRNAs. Um, we also want to know things like how difficult is it and how much does it cost? How difficult is the demultiplexing? Um, a general recommendation I've seen for users is to sequence to a read depth of at least 20,000 reads per cell and then opt for more cells rather than more reads if the budget is limited. And I think uh, one of the reasons for this is that for certain dimensionality reduction tools such as principal component analysis, if your number of variables, which in this case is genes, is greater than the number of observations, which is in this case cells, the algorithms used in the analysis of the data can become unstable, especially for sparse matrices. Okay, so briefly, I'm going to summarize some of the limitations of single cell RNA-seq technology and some potential alternative approaches and areas with ongoing developments. Okay, so first and foremost, the low capture probability and data sparsity poses serious challenges for the analysis and the interpretation of the data. One alternative that I mentioned that captures a much higher fraction of mRNAs per cell is BD Rhapsody. Um, though this approach sacrifices global transcriptome resolution and limits the experiment to only a few hundred mRNAs. Okay. Second, the current droplet-based approaches are unable to analyze full-length transcripts and in many cases cannot accurately quantify different isoforms or splice patterns. So if you're interested in that, an alternative would be to use the well-based SmartSeq platform. Though this approach is limited in the number of cells that can be sequenced and it also has poorer sensitivity to transcripts with low abundance. So another major limitation in the field is the inability to resolve spatial information. And MRFISH is one way to resolve the concentration of a couple hundred transcripts across individual cells. Though this is technically very challenging and it requires special microscopes. Another developing technology is SciSeq, which sections tissues on slides that have barcode spots pre-printed on them but this approach doesn't quite yet provide single cell resolution. And then finally, many researchers are interested in integrating single cell RNA-seq data with orthogonal measures. Um, and approaches here are very actively evolving. Um, people always want to get more data to try to solve the problem. Um, so for example, total seq uses conjugated antibodies to detect proteins in cell lysates. And these antibodies are conjugated to oligonucleotide barcodes so that they can be sequenced along with the mRNA um, that is expressed in the individual cells. Um, G and T seq is a similar idea that allows both the genome and transcriptome to be sequenced, though its current implication and similar um, technologies like chromatin accessibility and transcriptional sequence in the same cell are less accurate and sensitive, less accurate and sensitivity than doing either approach in isolation and then trying to compare the samples. Um, so there's a couple more things I wanted to mention about different experimental approaches. One is multiplexing. Batch effects in single cell RNA sequencing occur when you perform library preparation and sequencing on different samples independently. For example, you might prepare samples from different patients or animals on different days, or you might have treated your cells with two different drugs and you want to keep those cells separate so that you can 
um, distinctly separate and analyze global differences after the sequencing. Um, but batch effects alter the sampling of mRNA by the measurement technology. And they're unavoidable when samples are prepared, when libraries are prepared independently or in different batches. So it's not ideal to try and disentangle batch effects in the analysis step for reasons we'll talk about later. It's best to avoid batch effects through the design of your experiment. So one way to do this is to label cells from different treatments using hashtag technologies. These hashtags are again antibodies conjugated to oligonucleotides with sample specific barcoding. So now you have three layers of barcoders so that cells from different conditions, such as treatments with three different drugs, can be pulled together before library preparation and sequencing. And the barcodes allow the samples to be clearly distinguished for downstream analysis in comparison of different experimental conditions later on in your analysis. Um, so often for more complex tissues, researchers need to use a different strategy for multiplexing. Um, this is because for complex tissues, single cell RNA-seq is performed sometimes on nuclei instead of whole cells. And people do this because of the challenges inherent in dissociating fibrous extracellular matrices and isolating single cells. Um, for example, in tissues like the brain where cells are nebulous and dendritic, it's much easier to isolate single intact nuclei than an intact cell. So here, the idea is similar, but instead of affixing barcode antibodies to plasma membranes, you can also barcode individual nuclei um, before pooling samples, but you need to order different kind of reagent. So finally, one of the more, um, we'll talk about some of the multimodal technologies and one of the more developed and easier to use approach is SiteSeq. So this technology is, again, the same concept as cell hashing and multiplexing, where in this case, cell surface proteins are labeled with different oligonucleotide um, barcoded antibodies. Um, and unlike flow cytometry, this approach is not limited by spectral overlap. So Current studies are often able to measure on the order of hundreds of different cell surface markers simultaneously with measurements of single cell transcriptomes. And as you might expect, this approach is expensive and the cost of sequencing depends on how many antibodies are being used in the analysis. So I've linked a few publications here. The first is the invention of this technique. The second is a paper on the optimization of this technique, where essentially it recommends titrating antibodies in an optimization experiment prior to the full sequencing run, as they found that antibodies at five times lower concentrations that then commercially recommended can tend to show more linear or close to linear responses. And finally, this last paper is the most recent publication from the Sahita lab who developed the R software used to analyze single cell RNA-seq data called Surat. So in this paper, they describe an approach to the analysis of integrated multimodal data sets, whether it be site-seq or um, chromatin accessibility methods. And so in multimodal analysis, the idea is to use the two different types of data, sequence data or protein or chromatin or what have you, um, to find more appropriate clustering of the data or to reproduce observed trends in your single cell RNA-seq data. Um, that is, they, they try to better define boundaries between transcriptionally similar groups of cells by looking to see if there are coincident patterns of variation in an orthogonal data set. Do I know any lab in UCLA that does site-seq? Um, not off the top of my head, no. Um, sorry. If anyone else does, please feel free to speak up. Okay, so now if anyone has any questions, I can take them. And then 
we'll do a recap of what I just said using a Kahoot quiz. Um, I have a question about the uh, cell capture technique, um, not from site, uh, site seek, but the oil drop technique. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that you mentioned that uh, having the beads reduces the cell, uh, reduces mRNA capture, and it's uh, that benefits the cell or benefits the mRNA capture uh, for the beads. And I was wondering how, why. Oh, um, I think it's, your question is why, why do we have the beads and why do we have droplets? Why does it improve the recovery of RNAs in the measurement? And those are kind of two separate things. So first, just the, the droplets, having the chemistry occur in nanoliter sized droplets effectively um, increases the concentration of all the reagents so that they're closer together and things that are closer together have a higher probability of binding. So having things in very small droplets improves the um, likely, the probability that you'll capture mRNAs that are in pretty small concentrations to begin with. It also decreases the cost of the experiment because you don't need to have as many reagents so you can increase the number of cells that you sequence and thus have better sampling of your different distinct cell populations in the data. And then the beads are, um, were a critical innovation to overcoming amplification-based noise because they have the UMI, the unique molecular identifier, and cell-based barcodes. So instead of imagine sequencing each cell individually in your Illumina run, which I guess is what they did in 2009. You can pool all of your samples together using the cell barcodes to demultiplex them. And then the UMI counts are critical to overcoming the PCR-based amplification noise. So it reduces the nonlinear effects of, of PCR-based amplification by finding the individual molecules and tagging them before you increase increase the number of copies of that spe specific species. Um, um, thank you for clarifying. Um, I was also wondering as a follow-up question uh, that for how the uh, proportion of cells are, uh, proportion of transcripts is consistent um, after amplification uh, with the um, transcript barcodes with the unique molecular identifiers? Yeah, that's a good question. And the two studies that I showed kind of evaluate that empirically by asking how the, the if the read counts um, accurately represented the known concentration of the cells before. So they were asking how many reads you need to ensure that you have enough coverage of the sample to not like distort the original counts. And they showed that there was not a strong dependence on the depth of your sample, showing that most of the noise is in, induced by the low capture probability. So in the initial step of the reaction, it's harder just for the, the beads to bind the mRNAs that introduce the biggest error. Um, it's less you have a, less of a sampling problem when you're just reading the, the post amplified data. So at the beginning, you have very small numbers of mRNA that you're trying to capture. And that distribution is preserved when you amplify the data. And you have, sorry, I think a drawing this would definitely help me as a visual person, but it's just saying most of the noise is induced by the capture process rather than having insufficient sampling of the reading in the sequencing machine. Okay, I think I um, I think I will look into the paper and I have a good enough sense to investigate further. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Brianne, um, can I ask a question yeah. about yeah. site? 
So um, just to make sure I understand what you said about Zyseq correctly, mm -hmm. um, basically you have an antibody that has um, like a, some kind of a sequence barcode on it, right? I'm um, sorry, I think your connection is not very stable. So I, if you said something in the last oh, seconds, I didn't hear it. Sorry. Um, so my question for SightSeq is basically you have an antibody that has like a PCR barcode on it, right? And then um, do you treat the cells uh, to the antibody? before they are single cell encapsulated in the beads? Yep, that would be the idea. So you just bind your cells with the mixture of labeled antibodies. So it's restricted to only proteins on the surface of the cell in this case. Got it, okay. Um, okay, um, and so can you think of SightSeq as a way of like, identifying a particular subpopulation that expresses an antibody on the cell surface? Yes, definitely. I think that's its intended use. And I think it's especially useful for just evaluating kind of historical notions of cell identity. Um, so you have some prior okay. knowledge of like what kind of cells you might expect and you can test how transcriptionally similar or different they are. Okay. Um, so um, my final question is, okay, if that is the case, what is the benefit of SightSeq as opposed to just doing a flow cytometry step in order to enrich the population of cells you want? Yeah, um, I think they both have different pros and cons. One flow cytometry is much less expensive <laughs> and right. and you don't have as much information recovered. Whereas SightSeq, you can have like 300 different cell surface markers profiled. So you can have a little bit more information of, of the different distributions of cell surface markers on the surface that are directly paired with the transcriptional data. So in facts, you have bins of cell surface markers but in SightSeq, you get direct paired measurements of proteins on the surface and their transcriptional profiles inside. Oh, right. Um, you would get the transcriptional profile of the protein that you have the antibody to, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Wait, I also have a, um, I also wanted, I also have a question about SightSeq. I wanted to clarify how um, the data from the cell surface markers uh, is then applied um, in key, uh, applied for the demultiplexing from different, um, from different batches. So um, is it, um, are, is the data from the, multi, uh, from the, uh, um, from the SightSeq is what's used to design the cell barcodes? Um, no, the first part of your question is a very good question that I can say a number of things about, but the second part, the SightSeq is not used to inform the barcodes. The barcodes are essentially just like a randomly generated list of numbers that are assigned to each cell so that you just have a way to index um, and demultiplex each mRNA is belonging to a particular cell after you get the, the data out of the sequencing machine. And the first part of your question, does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you. The first part of your question is how do people do this multimodal analysis? And there are several ways, all of which are kind of very new and being developed. One is just to kind of use anchoring. So you do like unsupervised clustering on both different modalities and then look at the gene expression markers and say, okay, I know that this population, we'll call it like one cell type and it matches 
you know, this other population in my protein expression. And then you can just compare that, um, though it's not maybe the most informative approach. Other, other approaches attempt are, are attempting, to develop a, attempting to develop more sophisticated methods using like covariance analysis of the two groups simultaneously. Um, and then other ways also attempt to use machine learning to try to identify different bins using like the total or the total seek, the site seek protein markers based on a priori knowledge of what cell type should be to segment the um, transcriptional data. But I don't know too much about this very new area of research. Thank you so much. This was uh, very helpful for clarifying. Cool. Okay. Great. So why don't we take a um, seven minute break. So we'll come back at 2.42 and then we can do a Kahoot quiz to go over, recap all of the things I just talked about and check everyone's understanding before we move on. So oh, Brian, do we have access to the slides um, uh, for today and also tomorrow and the next day? Yeah, okay, thank you for bringing that up. I'll drop the course material link in the folder right now. I'm sorry, in the chat right now. Um, and you can see the slides there. And also, actually, I don't know if the slides are there. I'll upload the slides there. Um, but you can download some of the material that we'll be using later on in the workshop. Brianne, um, can I ask you your basic? Um, yes, you can, but um, you're still breaking up, so I definitely missed two words. Sorry, um, I have a... Do you know for the um, antibodies used um, in SightSeq, can more than one antibody bind to the same cell? Um, yes. I'm not, should you clarify your question a little bit more? So generally there's like 300 different species of antibodies and okay. Each one has its own unique molecular identifier, kind of like mRNA. So in the end, before the amplification step, you have an index of how many times that specific antibody bound to that cell, and then you can count how many binding events okay. there were. Okay. Um, and so in theory, in SightSeq, you can have like multiplex and paired um, RNA information, right? Exactly, yes. Okay. Um, so the one other thing I was a little bit confused by is if the antibody binds the cell before the um, gel bead encapsulates the cell, okay? Um, how does the antibody get that cell-specific barcode attached? Okay, so um, maybe your model of, of bead meaning cell is not quite clear. So inside the microfluidic device, the cells and the beads are flowed into droplets, oil droplets. Um, so mm -hmm. there's a single droplet. Inside the droplet, there are there's a cell with the different antibodies tagged to the surface with the site C barcodes. And then there's a separate bead. Right. Right. There's a separate bead with the adapters. Um, that bind to um, mRNA tails and include both the cell barcode and the UMI. So I guess in this case, the oligonucleotides of site seek, this is a guess, 
I would guess they include something like a poly A tail so that the bead can also bind to them and tag them with the cell barcode and the UMI. Uh, uh, okay, okay, got it. Yep, okay, that makes sense. Thanks. I have a quick question. Um, the, um, in the link that was provided, um, uh, I can't find the slides or there aren't slides in the link. And then also, um, um, in the best practices paper, they mentioned that uh, UMIs are not always added. Um, and I was wondering in what cases are they added and what cases they're not added? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so there's other technologies that are more plate based, I believe some of the earlier technologies don't always have UMIs. And some of these different technologies aimed to improve the probability of capture using slightly different approaches that I'm not super familiar with. Um, so all the more popular approaches now are using UMIs, but there's some more specialized techniques that do not. And oh. As far as the slides, sorry, I had to edit some things. So here's the parent folder of that workshop that should include slides from the last time that I taught this workshop, though I'm not sure the ones tomorrow are up to date because I will edit them before tomorrow. But you should see it in the in the link I dropped in the chat. Thanks. They really helped me follow along with the presentation. Sure. Yeah, to take notes. Maybe I should do that beforehand. Yeah, because um, it can be really difficult to um, uh, to um, note everything in the citation and like the main idea. So it's usually really helpful. Cool. Yeah, I'll try to incorporate that in the future. Okay, so for those who are having trouble installing ScanPy, um, today the interactive workshop is very short. I left a lot of time at the end of it just to help people who couldn't get the installation on their own to get it working. Um, so there should be enough time after to look into that. Um, so hopefully everyone is back from the break. Um, if you could navigate to kahoot.com or sorry, dot IT, we will do a short quiz to recap what we just talked about. I'll share the screen. Oops. Um, and by the way, recordings will also be made available to everyone, though they might take a few days to be uploaded. It's out of my control. Okay, so if everyone goes to www.kahoot.it and enters in this game pin, we can do this competitive quiz game where the faster you answer the question, the more points you get. <laughs> 
Okay, I'm gonna wait like 15 more seconds and I'll start. Okay, let's go. So inside of cell, what kind of RNA is the most abundant? The correct answer is ribosomal RNA. There is not a lot of messenger RNA within cells. Okay, question two. How many mRNA molecules are typically expressed in a mammalian cell? Yes, so the answer is 360,000 total, just to give you some numbers. So how many copies of specific transcription factors are typically expressed inside of a single cell? Yay, most of you got it right. Yes, so to the despair of many researchers who like transcription factors and have favorite ones, um, transcription factors tend to be expressed on the lower range of, of expression per cell. So you might only find five to 15 copies of one specific transcription factor gene. Oh, the latest, good job, Maria. Okay, so what's the typical concentration of mRNA inside a cell? Okay, yes, it's very, very low, less than 0.1 picogram typically, which makes the ability to capture mRNA is quite difficult. It's a low capture probability. So what's the minimum of mRNA we need to load the Illumina sequencing machine? It's a lot, you need a lot of mRNA. You need to about 5,000 times more mRNA than is in a single cell to get appropriate coverage by the sequencing reads. 
um, and this amplification step can induce a lot of nonlinearities into the distribution of genes, which is why we have unique molecular identifiers to bind mRNAs prior to the amplification step. So which disease does not belong? Great, most of you got it. Single cell ATEX seq is a way to probe chromatin accessibility in single cells, while the other three are single cell RNA sequencing tools. What are some ways to recover more lowly abundant transcripts? I'm glad most of you got it, although there's a slight trick answer in my question that is almost a typo. So there's some, some myths in the field that SmartSeq is better at recovering low abundance transcripts, but um, based on the, the um, experiment done in the Svensson et al. paper, um, not sure SmartSeq is more sensitive. Uh, BD Rhapsody, on the other hand, is a way to specifically target transcripts and is more sensitive at recovering those that um, generally have very low abundance. So what do we call an mRNA that is expressed by a cell but fails to be detected by the single cell RNA sequencing protocol? Yeah, so most of you got it right. They're called dropouts, although I think this name can be a little bit misleading. There's some, there's like an idea in the field that single cell RNA sequencing is zero inflated, which means that there are more zeros than what you would expect. Like the genes are dropping out of your measurement and you're not capturing them even though you should be. However, based on some models, some simple models of, um, captured distributions. Uh, there are numerous papers that show single cell RNA-seq is not zero inflated. It does not have more dropouts than would be expected based on a, um, a stochastic model of mRNA capture. Okay, so what technology enables accurate quantification of mRNA counts? in single cells. Yeah, I'm glad most of you got it right. This is maybe the most important 
lesson to take away from the first part of our talk, um, unique molecular identifiers. They're barcodes that bind to the specific individual mRNA molecules inside of cells before the amplification step. Okay, last question. What is a doublet? This is a doublet also. Great, a doublet is two cells that have been lysed and sequenced within the same droplet. These can introduce, um, and it's another way of introducing measurement error into your um, data set. And there are also a number of um, sophisticated models to try to identify these and then remove them from your data before downstream analysis, because they're not good, but it's best to avoid them experimentally. Okay, so here we go at the podium. Yay, Vicky. Soup. And congratulations, Maria. Um, okay. Great job, everyone. Let's, let's, hopefully that was fun for people. Um, and they also helped me get an idea of, of how good I'm doing. And how well you'll understand the material. Okay, so. Um, and let me get back to the presentation. Um, oh, <laughs> falling off the podium sounds painful, but we live in a virtual world, so hopefully it's okay. Okay, now can everyone see the screen? Yeah, thank you. All right, so now that we've covered different experimental approaches to single cell RNA sequencing, let's begin to talk about the data analysis workflow. So I'm first gonna give a brief overview the first step is pre-processing the data, which aims to demultiplex the sequencing data to produce your feature gene count by cell matrix. So today we're not going to talk about the demultiplexing process in detail. The basic idea is that what is fed into the sequencing machine is a pooled mixture of the mRNAs from all the cells in your experiment each mRNA is barcoded with the specific cell it came from and its unique molecular identifier. And then to extract your gene by cell feature matrix, you need to demultiplex the data. Generally, this process involves first barcode extraction and annotation to identify the barcodes that came from real cells. And then um, alignment mapping is applied and quality filtering to identify um, which mRNA, oh, yeah, which mRNA came from each cell. And then finally, feature annotation and quantification compiles how many of each mRNA was identified within each cell. 
Um, so if you'd like to learn in more detail about this process, the Collaboratory has a workshop which covers this material. It's called Galaxy for NGS Data Analysis. Um, and you can also find tutorials on the 10x Chromium and also the Galaxy website. So it's a more classical, well understood genomics alignment problem, essentially. But then after we don't demultiplex our data, we end up with a gene count by cell matrix where each, um, in this case, each column represents a single cell and the rows of that column are the sum of unique molecular identifiers that were detected for each gene species. And the first step in the data analysis pipeline is to filter the data using quality control metrics such as count depth with the idea being to remove low quality or dead cells from the gene by cell matrix. So here batch correction and then normalization are often applied. And then the next step is called feature selection. So like I said, droplet based approaches have reduced technical error in single cell RNA sequencing because here individual mRNAs from lace cells are bound to unique molecular identifiers or UMIs prior to PCR-based amplification, thus overcoming amplification-based bias in the measurement. However, the capture probability and resulting sparseness of this high-dimensional data remains a challenge to its interpretation. So a standard approach to the analysis of this data, um, in a standard approach, we employ a feature selection step where the observed variation is um, modeled so that we can select the genes where their observed variation is inferred to arise biologically as the variation exceeds what can be explained by a model of measurement error. So as a result, the dimensionality of the data is reduced to only contain biologically varying genes prior to partitioning cells into transcriptionally similar groups. Um, so once we've created a gene by cell matrix where we've removed low quality cells and technically varying genes that are not very informative for our analysis, what do we do next? Um, the, the general idea is to find groups of cells that have similar gene expression patterns. Um, and we do this using unsupervised clustering algorithms. The idea is that these groups of cells correspond to physiologically similar groups of cells. And researchers generally try to figure out what physiological cell type these clusters might correspond to just by looking at the expression of known marker genes for their system. Um, if acceptable clusters are achieved, the next step can be to quantify differential expression of class clusters or perform a compositional analysis to look at how cell identities change over experimental conditions. So for example, if you're studying development or differentiation of stem cells, um, these approaches are kind of combined sometime uh, by doing trajectory inference, which projects the cell clusters along a, an axis of time and tries to understand how cells transition between cell types. Um, and from this trajectory inference, you can do differential expression again um, to try to plot differential gene expression along an axis of pseudotime. Differential expression, there's a question, is, it, is differential expression based on at least two samples? And Yes, the, it's a good question. Um, I can link people to a paper if they're interesting, interested in this about like whether or not it's statistically appropriate to use the p-values generated from this like differential expression test when you are testing the gene expression of, between two clusters that you have determined based on the same data. Um, but in general, yes, differential expression is testing whether a gene's mean expression levels are significantly different across 
two or more groups. So there's a test group versus a reference group. And you can do this at the bulk level or within individual clusters. Um, okay. So in, in the end of the later half of today now, we're going to talk about how to deal with technical variation. And of course, it's best to avoid technical variation by doing the very best experiment possible. Um, but single cell RNA sequencing is a noisy technique that only captures about 5% of mRNA from each cell. And each cell's transcriptional profile is intrinsically variable from one cell to the next because of biology, as we've observed. So how can we distinguish between what is technical variation and what is biological variation? And the standard pipeline for doing this is to first use UMI counts, not reads, this avoids variation introduced by amplification and reverse transcription. Um, the second step is to use quality control metrics to remove low quality cells. And then the third step in the standard pipeline is to normalize the data, which assumes the same number of total mRNAs per cell. This is thought to account for cell to cell differences in read depth, though in practice, it can in introduce bias to the data. And the next standard step is to log transform the data. Um, this is applied in attempt to stabilize the variance that arises from differences in the mean expression of each gene. And then um, finally, all of these steps are performed um, in order to model which genes are biologically variable and which genes are varying only due to measurement error. And a common feature selection approach that's typically applied is called highly variable gene selection. Um, and then once we identify our biologically informative genes, which we assume are the HVGs, researchers typically apply principal component analysis to further reduce the dimensionality of the data and only capture the um, major axes of variation. Okay. So before we begin to try and separate technical and biological variation, which we'll discuss in detail tomorrow, let's recap where variation in the single cell RNA-seq data comes from. So first we have noise due to capture inefficiency. So if we can only capture 5% of the transcripts, we can expect to see some relationship between the mean of the mRNA and the number of cells it was detected in, for example. Um, there also still can exist some amplification bias. Um, if for a highly expressed gene, if the UMI barcodes approach saturation, um, but this generally only happens if your barcodes are too short and there aren't enough different barcodes. Um, so also noise can be introduced from preparing your library. mRNAs are unstable and can be degraded easily from experimental contamination with RNAs or just a high abundance of RNAs within your cell type itself, like in the pancreas. Um, also, mRNA can cause issues, ambient mRNA specifically, which means if you dissociate your tissues too harshly and lyse your cells, the free-floating mRNA can sneak into every droplet of your experiment and contaminate the output. So also, there are underlying sources of biological variation. Um, so first, just in RNAs themselves, they can vary in GC content and secondary structure and protein boundedness, et cetera, which can affect the rate of binding to capture beads. Also, cell traits themselves are biologically variable. The size of the cell changes its RNA content, um, for example. And finally, the variation that most researchers are interested in study, studying is the biological variation that arises due to phenotypical processes like differential expression involved in cell differentiation or during adaptation to varying tissue physiology. So now that we have some expectations about what kind of variation we might see, we can talk about the first step of quality control. And the goal here is to identify and minimize technical variation that arises um, from low quality cells. 
So what is a low quality cell? There are essentially three main parameters that inform us about the quality of the cell that has been sequenced. These are the count depth, the number of genes, and the fraction of mitochondrial counts. The count depth is the number of total UMIs that were detected in the cell. The number of genes is the number of different genes identified per cell. And the fraction of mitochondria is the fraction of mitochondrial genes relative to all genes within the cell. So all of these um, metrics tell us something about how many cells were in the droplet and what the quality of the capture process was. So for example, if the count depth is very low, we might expect that there that if there was a cell in the droplet, it might be very damaged or contaminated so that we only captured a small fraction or a thousand or so mRNAs. Um, alternatively, if there were only a couple hundred mRNAs captured, we might be concerned that what we sequenced wasn't a cell at all and that we are potentially having a high level of ambient mRNAs floating around due to overly harsh tissue dissociation. Um, but in this histogram, we can see a shoulder um, where these droplets only contain a few hundred distinct RNA molecules, uh, which is relatively low compared to the mean of the sample, which is a few thousand per cell. So we can use similar quality control expectations for the number of genes we observe per cell. For example, um, this shoulder here, there's only a couple hundred of distinct genes that were counted. Uh, this might be indicative of a cell that was um, damaged before a droplet encapsulation. So the mRNA was leaking out, or maybe when where maybe it's where the mRNA binding to the bead process is hindered by contamination. We don't really know, but it results in a cell where the mRNA counts are statistically more undersampled compared to the rest of the data. And we can use tools like an elbow um, estimator to identify what this cutoff should be. So building on the concept of a leaky cell membrane from harsh tissue, dis sorry, harsh tissue dissociation, researchers developed this other metric to um, approximate what is a low quality cell versus a cell with biologically low mRNA counts. And this is the fraction of mitochondrial counts. So it's thought to serve as an approximation for cells with poor membrane integrity. As the idea is if mitochondria are inside cells and are themselves encapsulated by a double membrane, if the cell's plasma membrane is punctured and all of the mRNAs leak out, the mitochondria might remain stuck inside the plasma membrane even though there's holes in it because they're big. And so then when the cell is partitioned into a droplet, the bead is capturing mostly just the mRNAs that were protected by being inside a secondary membrane structure. So that in low quality cells, we can expect that mitochondrial mRNAs would represent a significant portion of the total mRNAs identified within that cell. Um, people have also used this approach um, as similar fractional read counts using the spike in ERCC controls. So if there's a higher fraction of ERCC spikins, you might expect to have a damaged cell. And if you have a lower fraction of ERCC spikins, you might expect to have a droplet cell. Um, but overall, the takeaway from these parameters is that it's the best practice to consider, to consider multiple parameters jointly um, in order to remove poorly amplified or damaged probably dead cells and doublets. Because as you can see in this histogram, we expect a pretty high level of like natural biological variation in the count depth and gene and gene um, genes expressed per cell. So if we only look at one or one parameter at a time, we might um, accidentally exclude an interesting type of cell from our analysis. For example, T cells and immune cells in general express fewer mRNAs and other kind of cells. Um, is there any criteria for these thresholds? Uh, in the best practice, most people don't do this in, in, in as systematic way as I would like. 
um, what typically happens is people just look at scatter plots for two different things and then kind of visually say by eye whether or not there, ex there exists kind of two distinct populations. So in this case, we're just throwing out this kind of low count depth, low number of genes under sampled group right here, but we don't really know why, whether it's under sampled or if it's maybe like a red blood cell or something, unclear. Um, the other ways to do this are doing things like estimating the elbow point where um, their thresholds can be estimated as like cutoffs for, for a, a normal distribution. Um, so to summarize, when doing this kind of analysis, it's good to consider filtering outliers identified by the number of genes, the count depth, the fraction of mitochondrial reads, and if you have it available, the fraction of biological reads to ERCC spike in reads. Um, and also you want to be permissive as you risk losing real data and entire populations of varying cell types if you have overly harsh quality control thresholds. And another recommendation is to consider each sample independently. So if you have samples from different donors, you want to identify quality control metrics for each sample individually, as if you combine them all together, you would lose information overall. So you don't want to be in this, you want to have your, your samples and your quality controls filters look like the left situation where each threshold is determined independently compared to the right where the same thresholds applied across the board and you're losing important cell populations in, in donor 10 and donor three. Um, also, what can be helpful is orthogonal validations of your results later on. So do, does, do what using your analysis downstream map or match other, other observations of your data set? Um, do you see the same expected cell types and so on? Okay. So the next thing we will discuss is the motivation and assumptions of normalization and batch correction procedures. And the goal here is to normalize variation due to differences in count depth uh, in order to prepare for this model of highly variable gene selection. Okay. So again, in the idea of the pre-processing pipeline is to remove variation that arises due to measurement error alone. And we first do this by using UMI counts, not reads, filtering out low quality cells using quality control metrics and then the next two steps aim to prepare the data for a feature selection model that selects those genes whose variation cannot be explained by a model of measurement error alone. So this, this the next step after these filtering steps um, aims to identify highly variable genes. And it model to do so, it models the mean variance relationship for each gene to identify the subset of genes that vary the most across the sample. Um, as it's thought that these most variable genes will be most informative for finding biologically distinct groups of cells. However, prior to this modeling step, the gene counts are typically transformed. So first a counts per million or CPM normalization is applied to the data and the motivating idea here is to normalize for cell size factors such that cells with more mRNA do not um, overly contribute to the variance estimates in the data. And after CPM normalization, a log plus one transformation is applied. Um, and the idea here is to stabilize the variance for genes whose averages are order of magnitudes different. However, both of these techniques can introduce bias into the data, and I will break that down further for you. I have a question in the chat. Um, <laughs> so when you do QC, how do you differentiate a dead cell versus a non-dead cell? Um, you Well, first of all, you don't know for certain ever. So 
the idea is to use what we know about biological systems to kind of form inferences and, and establish thresholds for our quality control. So if we have a whole sample of cells, we probably wouldn't expect to find a subset of cells that have both very few different kinds of genes expressed and, and very low UMI counts total. Um, we might expect that rather than that happening due to biological differentiation, we see that because the cell is only a fragment of itself. So it's like a, we also know a priori that the tissue disassociation step can be really harsh on cell membranes and it has the potential to um, poke holes in the membrane um, because of the harsh chemicals used. Uh, so, so it's a combination of counts per cells, genes per cells, and then the fraction of mitochondria to the total mRNAs in the cell that can be used in combination to kind of infer whether or not two distinct populations of cells in your data exist. So you might expect to see like the shoulders that we saw in the histogram, um, or if it's plotted in two-dimensional space, two different blobs of alive and dead cells. So So your second question is before sequencing, there's a step where people look at the distribution of amplified cDNA length. Um, and what exactly are you looking for on this plot? Um, I am not super familiar with the looking at the distribution of the length of the cDNA. Um, what I expect people do this for is another quality control step to make sure that you're library was sufficiently amplified. So if you have a contaminated PCR reaction, for example, you might expect to see a, a lower quantity of amplified cDNAs and also um, the polymerase might have trouble fully copying the full length of all the fragments. Um, so you want to make sure that you have a good library prep be before you spend a lot of money to sequence them, I think is the idea, but I'm not sure. Okay. I hope that answered the question. Um, so let's talk about CPM normalization. The goal of CPM normalization is to adjust counts for potential read depth differences that occur from differences in cell size. However, in droplet-based approaches, the assumption that cell size can affect read depth, such that I guess the idea is that if you have a bigger cell, you might um, the read the capture process might become separated, uh, saturated. However, when we look at the data, we don't see any empirical support for this um, assumption. Um, and CPM normalization has it transforms the table globally. For cells with fewer reads than average, CPM normalization artificially increases the gene counts such that there are higher counts per million within that cell. As a result, this can induce variants for genes um, that have lower UMI counts on average. And then for cells with more reads, CPM normalization decreases the total number of UMI counts across that cell so that there are lower counts per million. And uh, these transformations are global such that they permute the covariance structures of the data, or in other words, the correlations between individual genes that can occur both within and across cells. So that alone is a bit concerning. Um, um, just four questions. Oh wait, could you explain how this connects again to the 
Um, covariate. The covariance. Um, uh, in the uh, in the um, the three QC covariates. Oh. Yes. So the idea there is kind of just to compress the distribution such that the cell size effect doesn't skew the distributions of the gene counts across the population. Um, but let's look at the distributions. It might be a little bit easier to explain. I think CPM normalization is often applied because it's it's a common approach to bulk RNA sequencing, but whether or not it's appropriate for single cell data is less, less clear. Um, so let's talk about it a little bit more. Okay. Um, just- uh, Brianna, I hate to interrupt yeah. you, but could you please tell us what the little R and the big R stand for in that formula? Yes, let's look at it. Um, so the each R, I believe, is the count or the concentration of each RNA, RNA species. So the I indicates it's each individual entry in the matrix divided by the total concentration, which in this case is counts of RNA per cell um, times a million because it's counts per million. So it's normalized such that um, each each species count, each mRNA species count is just the proportion of that to the total amount um, if there were a million reads in the cell. So that there's no longer cell size differences affecting the total number of mRNA counts per cell. However, if you look at the distribution of the total UMI counts per cell, which is plotted here in a histogram, um, it looks pretty normal to me. There might be more cells on this lower end that might represent undersampled cells for being dead or whatever reason, but um, I wouldn't expect a priori that we would need a normalization to um, adjust for read differences due to counts because it looks pretty, pretty good to me. So, so why should we do this? Um, like I said, I don't think this idea has been thoroughly validated um, using empirical or theoretical models. Um, and whether or not it helps some of the downstream analysis procedures is unclear. They are common in the analysis of bulk RNA sequencing, um, but it's, it's not clear that they make sense for single cell data. In particular, this is because oops, in single cell RNA-seq data, there are a lot of zeros it's very sparse. Approximately 95% of the count by cell data is comprised of zeros. And after normalization, a zero is still a zero. Okay, so let's look a bit more closely about how these transformations affect the gene distributions. Um, so here I have a histogram of the counts of one particular mRNA species across all the cells in the data. And this um, draft is taken from the Towns et al. paper that I sent to all of you. Um, so again, the number of counts for this one particular gene, we see what looks like a gamma distribution where there are many cells that don't have um, any counts. Uh, the majority of the cells have a few counts of this particular gene. Um, and then there's exponential decay in the number of counts detected per gene per cell for this gene. And just looking at this distribution, like I said, it wouldn't occur to me that we should normalize the data because let's look at what happens. Um, first notice how much the shape of this distribution changes. And remember that the next thing we're going to do is model the mean variance relationship for the cell, um, for each gene, sorry. And, and CPM, normalization does absolutely nothing to counts that were zero originally. They stay zero. So as a result, we're accentuating the differences between cells where this gene was captured and cells where this gene was not detected. Um, even though it's not clear to me that the, the difference in the presence or absence of this gene should be something that's exaggerated, 
or that should represent a discrete categorical change in cell physiology as when we look at this data, um, this kind of aligns with what expectations about a model of capture probability might look like based on a gene with a low general concentration in cells. Um, so the CPM normalization is inducing lots of variance because it's um, inducing a separation in the population where the zeros are now more pronounced from the mean of the data. Um, okay. So the next transformation that is typically applied to, in the analysis of single cell RNA-seq data is log plus one transformation. Um, people add a one because you can't take the log of zero. So the motivation for this transformation is that, again, in the next step where researchers are modeling the mean variance relationship of gene count data so to select those genes that are most variable for the downstream analysis. Um, in this model, the procedure depends on the assumption that variance is proportional to the mean across the span of mean values observed in the data. But um, in general, the mean variance relationship depends on the distribution that the sample was drawn from. And in single cell RNA-seq data, the distribution of a particular gene expression pattern across cells is not known beforehand. Um, and also the variance of a gene might be underestimated when the mean counts are close to zero. So anyway, to satisfy the assumptions of this highly variable gene model and enable um, the comparison of the mean variance relationship across genes whose mean span order of magnitudes of difference, a log plus one transformation is applied to the count by cell matrix to stabilize the variance. But rather than achieving this variance stabilizing effect, we can see that this additional transformation disproportionately, again, increases the dispersion of genes where a greater fraction of the genes have zero counts. Um, so as a result, when researchers model this transformed data to look for biologically varying genes, we might be enriching for genes that have more zeros just because they have lower expression values. So whether this is a useful practice for identifying groups of transcriptionally cells um, has not really been directly established. Yes, yes, okay. Okay, so here I'm going to highlight some other ways people aim to reduce the effect of variance due to technical noise and focus on their most favorite biological variants um, of their choosing. So, these include applying regression models to the data to regress out biological covariates. And the idea here is to remove cell cycle effects on the transcriptome or other unwanted sources of biological variation like mitochondrial gene variation, even though cell cycle or differences in, in respiration might be a distinguishing feature of particular types of cells um, regardless. People also attempt to apply various models to remove technical covariance like count depth and batch effects. Um, and another method called imputation, it attempts to remove, um, to, to replace the zero values by using trends observed in the data. But a major limitation of all of these approaches is that they tend to require many parameters that can be difficult to estimate, estimate when you don't know what the underlying distributions of a gene expression look like. So for example, if you have two groups, one that is treated with a drug and one that is not, you might expect to have a very different distribution of different cell types and gene expression profiles within the cell. And often these models can't account for all the different types of biological variants that we might expect in the data. Um, so it's because the distribution of particular gene expression patterns across cells is not known beforehand um, and that causes a problem as these models all impose strong assumptions about what gene expression distributions should look like. Um, but Anne, this is the very question that single cell RNA sequencing is attempting to address. So it's important to keep in mind as you do this analysis, um, it's important that you try to avoid 
introducing bias to your samples before interpreting the results. Um, so here I'm just showing an example of what batch effects look like and why researchers so often feel the need to correct for, for these effects in particular. So this is a TISNY plot where the high dimensional gene by cell data is projected down into two dimensions using a non-linear dimensionality approach. And you can see here, um, there's five different colors that kind of have this banding formation in the data. And this makes people um, respond with concern as the different batches appear to be clustering together, potentially due to differences in read depth across batches or other quality control effects. Um, so often what is done is an attempt to correct for these differences by imposing restrictions on the distributions of the gene counts and kind of mixing all the samples together. Um, but again, these are universal transformations that can destroy the, the, the covariance structures and the topology of the raw data and can pretty greatly affect the um, downstream analysis results. So it's best to design your experiment beforehand to avoid batch correction effects if you can do so. Okay, so to summarize here, there exist concerns with normalization and other transformation. Um, first, the idea is to remove unwanted variants, but biologists sometimes have expectations that might not be founded about what the what is wanted versus unwanted variants. For example, variation in si cell size exists. And without evidence that cell size can saturate the capture process, it's not clear that we should normalize for variation in cell size as we might be distorting our data and um, it might make it less easy to find kind of natural ways to separate our cell types later on. Um, specifically, even more concerning that we see that count depth correction and log plus one transformation artificially um, inflates variants for genes whose means are closer to zero. Um, it can also have the undesired effect of artificially inflating gene counts for genes that are only expressed in smaller cell types um, and disproportionately represent what genes are biologically varying within your sample. So you might miss out on interesting biological variants if you do these. So the best practice would be to be careful in the approach, but one thing to remember is you can always go back and, and apply different transformations and see how consistent your results are when using different, different approaches um, to see if you, your cell clusters are stable, if your results are reproducible, or if they're an artifact from attempts to normalize. Um, another thing to keep in mind is the best approach to batch correction and imputation is avoiding batch correction via experimental design using um, multiplexing tools. Okay, so I'm gonna pause again here for questions um, and then we'll take a break and in 10 minutes, so at um, 3.48, let's resume. We'll do a quick quiz and then we'll go through um, but loading data in ScanPy and doing some quality control filters. Uh, so I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so I understood the um, how the uh, both the distribution changed and uh, in the log CPM plus one and CPM and how it introduces, for example, um, more dropouts, but um, I still don't understand how it connects to the three QC covariates and covariate peaks. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So, so I think it's easier to think about these in two distinct steps. Um, although it's difficult in, in the, this analysis pipeline because there are many different steps that rely on each other. 
Um, so the first step is quality control and should be me thought of independently from all the other steps as the idea is just to use some knowledge of what is a live cell and what is a crappy cell and remove the cells that are have, have low information content. Although I'm not sure that including them would necessarily really change the results of your data regardless. Um, I don't think they have a direct connection to the normalization. Um, if you do include the cells that have low genes and low UMI counts and then do a normalization, you will artificially inflate those genes with low UMI counts so that they have equal UMI counts to the rest of the samples. And those genes, since they are have low counts to begin with, will have many more zeros and they'll be super variable cells. And they might actually um, kind of overly contribute to the axes of variation within your data set. So you don't want to overrepresent fake variance that occurs due to technical noise is kind of the, the theme of this segment. Okay, thank you. Sure. Oh, I also need help with Scampi or Scampi. Someone in the chat asked. Yeah, I imagine that a number of people might. Um, I myself haven't been able to install it on my laptop, but I also didn't try for very long. Um, so it can be difficult with Windows installation. So first thing I'm going to do is just share um, this web page that is useful. Some people have had more luck with the Anaconda installation as Anaconda is kind of like a environment software package managing um, distribution compared to other Python IDs. Sorry, I'm multitasking. Um, okay. So first thing, if you can't install ScanPy in PyCharm, it might be useful to install Anaconda from anaconda.com. Second, there are troubleshooting tips on the ScanPy installation website, which I will share if I can find the appropriate window. Um, so if you're using Windows, sorry, I would recommend that you navigate to this pre-compiled package and follow the manual installation instructions. Um, it's a little bit confusing. But why don't you, you can install any of the, okay. So because there are a number of you, I don't know. Why don't you, we share screens. Um, okay. So Invalid syntax error. So one, Google is your friend for many of these issues. Um, it's likely that someone else had the same exact problem as you already specifically. Um, so it's good to check. But generally the syntax for installing packages is navigating to the console and then typing pip install and then the name of the package. So for scanpy, it would be pip install scanpy. Um, 
Um, Ozzy, do you want to share what your problem was? Oh, sorry. Okay, it should be fixed. Do you want to try again? Oh, Brenna, can, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, I, I could like uh, install other uh, packages like the uh, the ones you suggested, but it's still like. Mm -hmm. When I like when I install the tables that you need me to. I still have Sorry, it's hard for me to read the red font. So did you try um, downloading that? Can you see? Is that the, um, are you running this on Windows? Yes, on Windows. And it's in the uh, command prompt. Uh, it's command prompt. Um, exit is one, and then so where is the error? Oh, moving too quickly. Yeah, I guess I was like trying to install each different version of the tables, but none of them succeed in store. Yeah, so there should be somewhere where it says what the error was. So there's invalid syntax. Um, is there a different issue? Tables. Um, there is a difference between pip install and conda install. Conda is like a way that organizes local environments and tries to avoid problems with versions. Um, but setting up environments can be tricky. And ScanPy in particular doesn't play nicely with Windows. Um, one thing that I think you can try, Ozzy, is downloading the package from. Yeah, the website you just showed yeah. us, right? Oh, OK, I'll try that to see whether it, it could work. Not um. Okay, um, let's go do the Kahoot quiz and then um, while you try to see if it works. And then we have just a short tutorial today to make sure everyone can get the data loaded. And then after that, we can, we can talk more in detail about um, installation with specific people. I'm not sure there's a conda command to install a scan by either. Oops. So that everyone could navigate to the Kahoot website again and enter this game pin. We will recap the material before we move on. <laughs> 
give everyone like 15 more seconds and then we'll start. Okay. So what percent of mRNAs do we capture per cell in droplet-based approaches? Yes, it's estimated to only be five to eight um, percent. And since it's so low, there are a lot of zeros, but single cell mRNA sequencing is not zero inflated. However, you must be careful because many popular pseudotime and other imputation models, et cetera, use zero inflated model as the basis. Um, so keep an eye out for different models assumptions. Okay. So what is not an appropriate parameter for quality control filtering? Correct, the fraction of ribosomal mRNA per cell. Um, although it's a similar idea as the mitochondrial read fraction, the mitochondrial mRNAs are protected by a second membrane, the mitochondria. So if the membrane is leaky, all the cytoplasmic mRNAs leak out and there's a higher proportion of mitochondrial reads to the total cell. And we expect this proportion to be pretty large like maybe like 50%, because we also expect to observe some variation in the fraction of mitochondrials across the sample of cells. Okay, so why, I just answered the question, we'll see if you were listening. Correct, most of you. Um, high mitochondrial read fraction is an indicator of low quality cells because the idea is that if you overly permeabilize your cells to dissociate them, it will induce holes in the cell membrane and the cell, the, the cytoplasmic mRNA will leak out while the mitochondria will stay inside because they're big and there'll be lots of mitochondrial mRNA compared to all the other reads. Um, and I guess there's not a lot of direct evidence for this concept, but it is something that is frequently observed in single cell RNA sequencing, whether if you scatter the data on um, two, two quality control metrics, uh, like mitochondrial read fraction versus total number of cells, you'll often see like a distinct subpopulation of cells that have a low number of overall reads or counts and a very high fraction of mitochondrial mRNAs, which we likely attribute to 
cells with holy membranes that are either dead or of poor quality. So what is not a pitfall of too strict quality control? So the main motivation of quality control is to remove technical variation from the measurement process before you try and estimate variable genes um, because these technically varying cells that have low numbers of reads, high numbers of mitochondrial can, um, because they have low numbers of reads, there's more zeros and they can induce a lot of variation in your data, and we don't want to introduce that bias into our downstream analysis. Um, but we also, we don't want to be too strict in our QC filters. We want to be conservative because we don't want to lose um, cell populations that are naturally variable or naturally deviate from the mean number of genes or UMI counts. Okay, so in a standard single cell RNA-seq analysis pipeline, what transformations are typically applied to the count by cell data? Great. Nearly all of you got this answer correct. Um, CPM normalization is counts per million. So it normalizes each cell though, so that it has an equivalent number of total mRNAs. Then each mRNA species counts are adjusted to reflect the proportion of total mRNA it accounts for on a per cell basis. Whereas RPKM normalization is reads per I'm not sure, actually, I forget. Um, but it's an approach to, is usually applied in bulk mRNA sequencing um, to account for differences in the transcript length on a per gene basis, as um, the genes that are longer have a higher probability of being sampled compared to the genes that are shorter. Not the case for single cell RNA sequencing data because it binds to the poly A tails. So what is the major assumption of CPM normalization? Great, most of you got this correct. So the implicit assumption imposed by CPM normalization is that each cell has an equivalent amount of mRNA. And, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Let's move on. What kind of bias can these global transformations induce? 
Great. Um, the correct answer is all of the above. These transformations artificially, well, they, as we've seen, they um, create a pronounced difference between cells that don't have a gene and cells that have the gene because um, these normalizations don't do anything to values that are already zero. Um, we also see an inflation of gene counts when you have a subset of cells that have low transcript numbers in general. Um, and we didn't talk about this in great detail yet, but these global transformations can introduce topological distortion in the cell neighborhood structure, such that cells that were neighborhood that had similar expression profiles in the raw high dimensional space um, may no longer be close in the distance matrix when you apply these transformations. And the distance matrix is important because it creates the basis for um, cell type clustering later on in our analysis. Good job, Sub. Unroll. So what's the best way to avoid artifacts introduced by batch effects? Yes, the correct answer is by multiplexing your samples before you sequence them. Let's see if to retain the lead. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yay. All right, um, now let's get to the ScanPy tutorial. Brianne? Yes. Um, quick question. So um, regarding using mitochondrial um, RNA as a potential um, quality control, mm -hmm. I was wondering, you know, have people ever looked at using um, like, like, um, maybe, um, I don't know, uh, nucleolar um, RNA? Um, if you're doing like a single cell uh, nuclei sequencing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'm not super familiar with single cell with nucleotide sequencing, but I imagine they. Uh, that. Uh, because uh, um, theoretically, nucleolar, uh, um, sorry, nucleolus also has RNA, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. So, like, mitochondrial mRNA are kind of a distinct subset of mRNA because they're expressed by the mitochondrial genome. I don't know uh -huh. if you can classify nucleolar mRNA. Oh, I'm not sure if it's whether it's a distinct subset of genes or whether it's just like a differently sampled subset of genes depending on the cell. I'm not super familiar with nucleolar mRNA, but the mitochondrial ones are easily identified and annotated just because that's where they are expressed from the mitochondrial genome. I think it would also be difficult to capture because of the proteins associated with it in the nucleolus, but maybe I think that, I thought, I think that mRNA, I think, or it's not mRNA, uh, mitochondrial RNA um, uh, isn't uh, associated with proteins, which is why I make the assumption, but if I'm wrong on that, then that probably why. Well, that's also a good point. How bound an mRNA is to other things can definitely affect um, its capture probability. I noticed there's another question in the chat, but right now my Zoom window is not cooperating and I can't see it. 
So sorry about that. We have two slides before I'll, we'll get into the scan by session. Um, so hopefully the majority of you were able to get scan by running in Python. Um, and we're able to install all of these libraries that are required for ScanPy to work. Um, ScanPy is software developed by the Theus Lab who wrote that best practice paper that I sent out in the email. Um, NumPy is a software package for um, numerical computations in, in Python. Pandas is kind of a data management software package that puts your data into data tables that are easily accessible um, by Python. Matplotlib and Seaborn are both um, graphic hi, hi. Plotting, plotting libraries. Um, and the Sliden algorithm is a clustering algorithm that happens to be a dependency of ScanPy. Okay, so let's, let's get to it. If you don't already have Python version greater than 3.7 solid, I recommend downloading Spider from anaconda.com. Um, oh. Okay. Um, interesting. All right, so now do people want me to show them where Anaconda is on the internet or shall I just jump into the tutorial as we don't have that much time? But I'm happy to catch up with people who don't have the installation uh, at 4.30. I'd appreciate if we go through it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, do you have um, Python installed? Or no? Or do you want to wait till the end? Um, and a Honda. So if you go to um, products, individual edition, and then scroll down, you should find three different Anaconda installers. Choose the appropriate one for your operating system and let it run. And then um, I will walk through some of the initial steps of this quality control filtering procedure and we can check in after to see if everyone's installation is up. And I'll go through this again tomorrow. So if- Hey, can I ask what, uh, I, I downloaded Anaconda and I'm, I'm working with Jupyter Lab mm -hmm. uh, and it looks a little bit different from what you got on the screen right now. Uh, so what what is the like best, I don't know how to say it, but, like platform for like typing like Python into? Sure. Um, I, there's not a correct answer. There's a number of different IDEs. I use PyCharm because I, that's the first one I, I chose and installing different IDEs can, can cause issues on your operating system. So um, in general, you should be able to find a terminal or a Python console, and then there should be another window to see your variables. Um, and they should all have kind of similar functionality. I like this one because you can hover over things and it tells you about different functions. Um, often instructors use Jupyter notebooks to teach classes as they have like little separate windows and text above and then you can just highlight and print things out. I chose to do this workshop using an ID because I find that more people who use Python and develop code in Python um, don't don't do it in a Jupyter notebook, though there are exceptions. Um, okay, cool, thank you. Yeah, so the commands are gonna be a little bit different um, in terms of shortcuts. So first, for example, to execute any 
segment of code in this Python IDE, you can just highlight um, the commands that you want to run and then right click in an anaconda. It might be a different shortcut, but for example, there should be a run, sorry, run selection, execute selection in Python console. So in this one, the shortcut is Alt Shift E, um, though it's different in Anaconda and I forget what it is, sorry. Okay, so we can start with importing our libraries and um, this should import the libraries without errors if we were able to install them all correctly. Um, and so Python is a is organized as a package.module.function language. Um, the recommendation for this workshop is that you all take intro to Python as a prerequisite. So I don't want to spend too much time going into how Python works. But in general, when we have commands, we first call the package, which is kind of a hierarchical like the larger library. So we're importing scanpy as sc. So in our command, we'll have sc.settings, and setting is the module of the um, package. And then we will have the function as the um, last element in the string of commands. So in this case, verbosity is the function to just kind of set up what kind of warnings we'll see on our screen as we execute these commands. Uh, and this Scan by settings module sets some of the figure parameters just so they're a particular size on the screen for this tutorial. So pressing Alt Shift Enter. The other one might be Control Enter. And hopefully everyone should see some commands being executed in the console. And once we start assigning variables, they should appear on either your variable window over here or over here or somewhere. Um, so the first step in a general Python workflow is setting up a directory of where you're going to save your graphs. So here, um, my path to my directory is just my desktop in this folder called single cell RNA sequencing workshop. You should modify this to um, reflect where you downloaded the workshop materials Sorry, I dropped a link earlier. I um, meant to do it again. I can add it to the chat now if people don't have them. Oh no, I can't see the chat box again. Yes, PyCharm is also, is what I'm using. Um, okay, so hopefully everyone has the course materials downloaded. Um, I'm going to drop a link in the chat again, and you'll find it organized by day. So in day one, what you'll see is um, one Python script, which is what I'm showing on my screen, and then three files um, with two with TSV extensions and one MTX file. And that is data that we will be starting this tutorial with. Okay. Okay, so if you don't already have that, the link is in the chat. Um, and now we can go ahead and start loading data. Um, into the Python console. So I'll set up my directory. This R tells Windows to read this string, um, slash B is an escape key. So you don't necessarily read it, but it bypasses any escape keys. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is, is take those um, barcode TSV um, and matrix.mtx files and load them, assign them to an object called A data. So scanpy, um, the read10x mtx command, if you highlight over it, it tells you specifically what it does. So this is set up to 
um, load in a 10x genomics form formatted um, cell by gene data matrix, where the barcodes are the cell headers, the sorry, the index I think is the gene headers, and the MTX file is data stored in a um, sparse matrix format to save space and not um, encode the zeros. So ScanPy, if you point to your folder, which contains these three files, it will compile the three different files into one object, which is the annotated data ScanPy object. Um, so hopefully, Everyone is still with me at this step, and we can kind of check out what our annotated data object looks like in a few different ways. First, if we just print the annotated data object, we should see that we have an object with a certain number of observations, which are cells, and a certain number of variables, which are genes. So here we have 2,700 cells and 30,000 genes. I downloaded. Um, this data from the ScanPy tutorial on the website um, of the ScanPy uh, documentation. And it is um, the 3,000 uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So we have 3,000 immune cell types. Um, you can also explore the annotated data object by clicking in the drop down arrow, arrow um, within your variable window. And you can kind of see how this data is. Um, organized. Um, oh, shoot, I don't have the image, but um, in general, the data in the matrix is called X. And then there are a number of different types of features kind of stacked on top of this object where we can create new observations that access X and get saved within the annotated data object, which is kind of one of the general features of ScanPy is to um, allow you to organize your data in this way, the like flexible way of storing different variables that are attached to your data. Okay, um, so there are a number of different functions in the ScanPy software. Uh, first, let's just use some of the data exploration tools. So we will use the um, plotting function, which is scanpy.pl, just to show some of the most highly expressed genes in our data. And we're just going to call our annotated data object and print the top 20 most highly expressed genes. And I forget what these top three are, but I noticed there's a lot of ribosomal protein genes um, and some actin genes. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows these and, and might doing, doing these kind of things, if you're familiar with the biology can be reassuring because you can be like, oh yeah, I would expect to see these particular lymphocyte genes as the highly expressed genes in my data. Um, Okay, so now we can start doing some of the quality control filters. I'll just minimize this annotated data object so we can see some of the variables better. So here we're creating a new observation. So we're adding a variable called MT. And what we're doing is we're querying all the variable names that have strings that start with MT. Um, this is convenient, and this is how mitochondrial genes are annotated in the human genome. So first, we're just going to create a new matrix of all the genes that start with MT. Okay, um, so that happened. And now we can calculate the QC matrix, which are easy in ScanPy as it's a built-in function. Um, I'm sorry, I'm moving through this kind of quickly, but you can read about the documentation um, if you're interested on the website or also if you just hover over it, I'll tell you a little bit what's going on. And then if you want 
to visualize some of the QC matrix, we will plot some violin plots. So our kernel density estimators of the underlying distributions of some of these features. So we're going to look at the number of genes by the counts per genes and the total number of counts and the percent of mitochondrial genes in our data. And we see something that looks like this, um, which gives you some general sense of what the quality control parameters are. You can see on average, we have not a lot of genes for each cell, not a lot of total counts around a thousand, a couple thousand here. And most of our cells have maybe like 2% of mitochondrial genes making up their total number of genes, but there are some outliers that have more around like 15 to 20%. Um, so I think a, a prettier way of visualizing data is generally using um, Seaborn. So you can use Seaborn um, with your ScanPy annotated data object pretty seamlessly, just to plot what your distributions look like. Um, so here's our gene by count data in a histogram instead, and we can see um, what that looks like. But it's a bit easier to see when you plot two variables at once, what we might set as thresholds for good quality versus low quality cells. So here we can plot a scatter plot to do that. And we can call, we just assign the variables um, using the names of the observations in the annotated data object. So we're plotting a scatter using annotated data where X is the total counts in this case. And Y is the percent counts mitochondrial. Um, I'm just gonna switch this. And what you see initially is some cells that have a whole lot of counts that you might expect to be doublets and some cells that have very few counts, but you can see when you plot this joint distribution that there are the cells that have the highest fraction of mitochondria also tend to have the lowest number, also fall within the lowest bin of total counts. So we might want to set a threshold pretty cleanly here at the percent counts mitochondrial to trim off this tail of the distributions. We can assume pretty safely that these are unhappy at the least cells. Um, similarly, we can get an idea of, of doublets by scattering the number of genes by counts versus total counts. And we see most of our data falls within this region, but there are some that are pretty obviously outliers. Um, so so if you wanna save your figures, you can type the command um, get current axis and then save your figure to the path that we designated using the large root, um, which is my desktop in this case. And then you can concatenate strings using the plus and don't forget to add slashes. And then you can name your, your figure as QC before. And you can save it as a thing or an EPS for vector graphics, whatever you choose. So another pretty way of plotting it, just thrown it in there is a joint distribution plot with marginal histograms. Give you more of an idea of what might be strained shoulders on your distributions or where you might want to apply thresholds or if you want to apply a more statistical model to determine what is an outlier or whatnot. This can be a helpful way to look at your data. Okay. And a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. Okay, so unfortunately, um, Surat and ScanPy best practices use just like, I think it's okay. They just estimate the quality control filter by I and say, okay, um, these, these populations of cells pretty clearly fall outside of the normal distribution of our data. 
So we're going to just visually determine what our threshold, our quality control filter threshold will be. Um, and looking at this data, oh, sorry. I'm a little bit ahead of myself. So in ScanPy, they apply a basic filtering step where you just straight off the bat say, I don't want any cells that have fewer than 200 genes or, and I don't want any genes that are expressed in fewer than three cells. Um, I guess the idea here is to remove very sparse, sparse genes to avoid introducing very high variance later on. It's an additional safeguard against what is inevitable in the highly variable gene method, but unless that's what they do. Okay, so to actually filter the data by slicing the annotated data object, um, we can simply do some indexing on our data set where we have um, here I'm creating a new annotated data object called bData so that we can go back and compare our annotated unfiltered to our filtered bData. And to apply the threshold, we simply say we want to retain the entries in the bData for the observations where the number of genes we, we oh, we want to exclude those where the number of genes is less than 2,000, and we want to exclude those genes where the number of mitochondrial counts is, oh, I'm sorry, I'm misspeaking again, a little bit rushed. So let's look at our graphs. Here we can, this is the suggested threshold according to the ScanPy developers would be to include those cells whose fraction of mitochondrial counts are less than five. So we're just going to draw a line here and only retain these cells in our matrix. Um, and we're also going to filter the, the cells by the number of counts they have total. And we're going to keep those that have less than 2000 to avoid potential doublets, which seems a little bit not very conservative in my opinion. But then we can we can plot a scatter of the after filter just to see, see whether or not our code is doing what we expect it to. So it's a good idea. And we can see that we have successfully remove these outlier data points um, from our data. Okay. So I'm sorry that is not super interactive today. Um, tomorrow there'll be more activities for you to discuss and um, problem solve with each other. But um, the hope of this workshop day one was that you have a basic understanding of what the experiment, experimental approaches are and um, that everyone can get some data loaded into Python. So I'll stop talking now. Um, I'll take any questions people might have and I'll stick around to help, to try to help people get this running. Uh, Brianna, if no one else needs help with the code, I tried troubleshooting with uh, Tim earlier uh, for my error for downloading Scampy because I followed um, all the instructions, including using uh, pip to install Scampy, um, but I'm still getting an error because um, um, I can't build